All right. So uh, the lecture today is called The Common Print, Gandhi and the Nationalist uh, Imaginary. And uh, before I begin, let me just uh, offer some general reflections. So when we're looking at, when we're looking at uh, Gandhi, uh, there has long been in place what you might describe as a hagiographic view, right? A view that tends to view Gandhi as almost a, a divine figure, a figure beyond reproach, beyond criticism. So the word hagiography is a word that is used uh, to uh, uh, refer to the lives of saints. Uh, so, you know, if you look at Christian saints, medieval Christian saints, for example, uh, their biographies were usually known as hagiography. So there's a halo, as it were, around them. Uh, now, uh, uh, Gandhi, as I've suggested uh, often, uh, was a figure who actually was subjected to intense public scrutiny, intense scrutiny. I mean, there are probably very few figures in history at that time who in their own lifetime were subjected to such intense scrutiny. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that facilitated that scrutiny was that Gandhi himself was extremely open about everything that he did. And one of the reasons he was open about it is because of course he took the view that secrecy itself was a form of violence. And that since he was moreover a public figure, it was incumbent on him to lay his life bare to the public like an open book, right? So everything that, that he does is recorded in minute detail often by Gandhi himself. And he was subject, subjected to vigorous and even virulent criticism, uh, I would argue, uh, at least from 1919, onwards, some of it even earlier, but certainly from 1919-20. Why do I say 1919-20? Because by then Gandhi has ascended to the height of Indian politics. In 1920, he's going to be already in a way uh, crowned informally as the major figure in Indian nationalist politics, right? So even though there has been a hagiographic view, and then there was this nationalist view which sort of looked at the nationalist movement or the freedom struggle as it's called in India um, and uh, placed Gandhi at the top of the hierarchy. There were a large number of figures who were involved in the nationalist movement, but, but Gandhi was very often viewed as being as someone who was uh, at the very top end of that nationalist hierarchy. But in the last three to four decades in particular, uh, we have seen a different way of approaching Gandhi coming to the fore. Uh, some scholarly works that have alerted us to different ways of reading Gandhi. So what would a Gandhi from below look like as opposed to Gandhi from the top? Gandhi from the top would be, let's say, a nationalist historian paying reverence to Gandhi uh, or uh, someone who is writing an account of the freedom struggle and looking at it from the point of view of the Congress party, which was a party that, that Gandhi uh, formally headed only for one year, but informally he was a, the head of that party for, for close to three decades until, uh, until nearly his death, right? So that would be looking at it from top down, right? The leaders dictate policies as it were, uh, and then people follow their leaders and their followers. But what would it look like to see Gandhi from below, from below, right? What did the working class think of him? What did, what did, um, um, illiterate peasants think about Gandhi. And if they thought about Gandhi, how do we actually access what they thought, right? They didn't write books, most of them. So Shahid, Shahid Amin, who's a historian of India, taught at University of Delhi for many years, just retired very recently, a few years ago. Um, he wrote a, a really a brilliant piece called Gandhi as Mahatma, which attempts to look at Gandhi from below. So one of the things that he does in that piece is he says, well, you know, let me look at what happened when Gandhi was going to arrive in a place called Gorakhpur. Gorakhpur is in North India. He was going to arrive there for a large meeting. This is in the early 1920s, as I recall, uh, when Gandhi was already now the Mahatma, Mahatma meaning the great soul. Remember that Mahatma is, is a title that is conferred on Gandhi, right? That's not part of his name, uh, not the name that, it, that was given to him at birth. So Shayad Amin says, 
let me look at what the local newspapers, for example, had to say. What were the kinds of rumors circulating about Gandhi? Right? And, this, and the use of rumors to study history is something that, that, that French historians have done when they looked at the French Revolution, because again, in the 20th century, in, in, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, uh, revisionist accounts of the French Revolution started to, started to uh, take place. Uh, which really looked at the place of uh, such things as, as uh, rumors uh, and, and certain kinds of lowbrow literature, if we can call it that, right? What view do we get of the French Revolution if we look at that? So similarly, that's what Shahid Amin is doing. And he found, he, he found uh, some really remarkable things. Uh, so for example, one of the ways in which uh, Gandhi's name was used by the people, right? Is the following, that th there is a report that Gandhi is going to come and speak at Gorakhpur and then a number of villagers in that area uh, decide that they are going to use the news of Gandhi's impending arrival to try to persuade their fellow villagers who had not been converted to Gandhi's way of thinking. So let's say there, there's a village and just random example, there are several hundred people living in that village and some people have not yet been converted to Gandhi's way of thinking, right? They have not been converted to the idea that nonviolence is a way to achieve freedom. Uh, Gandhi was also a champion of prohibition, uh, right? So, uh, and the villi those villagers who were drinking alcohol are not persuaded that, that prohibition is necessary or that alcohol is evil. Right? So what did these other villagers who were followers of Gandhi do in that case, right? So they, they're using the news of his arrival to tell these villagers the Mahatma is about to come. And if you don't stop drinking, you know what's going to happen? Shit is going to fall on your heads. And here, by the way, I'm not using the word shit metaphorically literally in some of the rumors, it was like, you know, your whole house is going to be covered with feces, right? Or the rooftop that you have, which was made of, it's a thatched roof because this, this is village India, people are very poor, they're not using concrete. This roof is going to collapse. Or let's say a villager is eating flesh. Now Gandhi was a vegetarian. Of course, Gandhi would not have at all approved of the idea that people should be coerced into eating up meat. Entirely to the contrary, Gandhi was always insistent on the fact that even though he was a vegetarian, so let's say a non, let's say an Englishman comes and lives at his ashram, and he knows that this Englishman eats meat three times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Gandhi would often insist that meat be served to that person, although his entire ashram itself was vegetarian, because he would say this is the ethics of hospitality, right? This man is accustomed to this kind of food for his meals, and we're going to offer it to him. And of course, if he decides he's not going to eat it, that's up to him, right? Since he's aware of the fact that he's in an ashram where no one else eats meat, right? But you never coerce anyone. So now going back to that story, the story there simply is that a villager tells another villager who, who loves to eat meat and fish, you know, if you don't stop eating that because Mah the Mahatma disapproves of flesh, right? If you don't stop eating it, your eyelids are going to get stuck. That is that when you wake, wake up in the morning, you're not going to be able to wake your, open your eyes, right? And, and then some of the rumors tell us that lo and behold, the next morning, this person is not able to open his eyes. And of course, you, you read that story and you think to yourself, ah, this is the villager mired in a life of superstition. But then of course, we have to understand what place miracles have in narrating the life of a great man. I mean, remember, you cannot even begin to understand the rudiments of Christianity as it was practiced over the centuries without thinking about the place of miracles. And of course, the place of miracles and Christ's own life, according to the gospels, right, is attested, at least according to the gospels, right? So Christ can, Jesus can produce loaves of bread and fish, right? thousands of them for a 
a feast if necessary. He can walk on water. What are these are miracles? And of course, they're very intense, complicated theological questions. Does the truth of Christianity rest upon the miracles? And of course, many people would argue, of course not, right? Because you don't have to believe in miracles to believe in Christianity. But what exactly is the relationship of Christianity to miracles? Right? Now, that's the kind of that's a kind of question that emerges, for example, from Shayid Amin's article. What he's really looking at is Gandhi from below. All right. And, and when I say Gandhi from below, what I also mean is that there was this authorized version of Gandhi. And this is the authorized version that would get replicated throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, down to a present time. The authorized version is what we might call the version that is authorized by the state, right? Or by civil society, that the consensus view is the authorized version, right? What is extraordinary, as Shahid Amin shows us, is that Gandhi, the great prophet, as it were, of ahimsa nonviolence, that his very name is used by some people to actually commit violence, that there you would have a demonstration of people, you know, uh, uh, the incident of Chauri Chowra in 1922, which you have read about, right, if you recall the great trial and the, my preface to that. Uh, so uh, these people are marching down the street, they're claiming to be followers of Gandhi, they're chanting his name, long live Gandhi, long live Gandhi, and then what do they do? They go and they kill 20 policemen right, while chanting Gandhi's name. So Gandhi's very name, Shahid Amin argues, is like a, like a floating signifier. That is that you could, it's like an empty vessel. You put things in the vessel. So Gandhi's name is what, uh, uh, what philosophers, semioticians would call an empty vessel, right? You could attach any kind of thing that you wanted in a way to his name. And the point here is that this is, a view of Gandhi, which is extraordinarily different from the view from the top. Now, one of the ways to look at Gandhi here is to look at a class of literature. And when I say literature, I don't mean the written text, I mean the print, okay? And here I don't mean oil paintings either, although there were plenty of oil paintings that were done um, of Gandhi. And when we are looking at the kind of prints that I want to focus on today, so these are prints which are in black and white. They're in black and white. Um, and, and as I've said, these are only a small class of the set of visual representations that we have. So you can think about the representational apparatus that was used to put forward the idea of Gandhi to the Indian masses. All right. Um, how did the masses understand Gandhi's life. How did they understand his biography? I mean, India, 1920, 1930 is a place where the literacy rate would have been 10%, 15%. There would have been very few women who would have been educated. I mean, the literacy rate for women was probably one to 2%. Um, and if you think that that's an exaggeration, I can assure you that there are parts of districts of India where female literacy is still less than 10%, all right, in the year 2020. There are also districts in India where the rate of literacy is 100%, all right, but, but there's huge variation across India. So people were not, most people were not reading biographies of Gandhi, they were not reading newspapers. And if you had to get across ideas about what Gandhi was doing. What kind of man is he? What's his, what's his life story? How did he rise from coming from a relatively humble background to becoming a world historical figure? Right? How did he deploy the idea of nonviolence? How did people ordinarily understand all of this? Right? So there's this, there's this what we might call class of ephemeral literature, which includes things like posters, prints. You know, it's like if you were today, you were to understand the sensibility of America. One of the one of the things you would do is what? You would have to turn to social media. Now, 90% of it might be complete trash. You know, trolls using the most obscene words about this or that figure, right? But you, you could also look, for example, at stickers at the back of cars. 
this is all in a way material that a historian might possibly use. And historians didn't make use of the kind of material that I'm gonna show you today, right? Because what people use was they would say, all right, let's read the report published from the Congress party. Let's look at an official document produced by the colonial state that was responding to Gandhi, right? Let's look at what the times, I'm talking about not the times of India, but I could easily be talking about that as well. I'm talking about the, about the Times newspaper published from London, which was the major newspaper published in, in England. Right? Those would be the sources that people would, that historians would ordinarily look at, right? It would be, the equivalent would be looking at the New York Times today, which would be very different than, than looking at social media and what people are saying on Twitter or Instagram, uh, um, uh, not to mention 4chan and 8chan and all of that, right? So this is the kind of literature and it's important for me to have given you that long preface so that you understand why it is that this literature can be useful and why is it that a historian or indeed any intellectual working on these kinds of things needs to make available to herself or himself the resources of the imagination to think about what is really happening. But before I go to these black and white prints, it is very important to mention that, that uh, these prints that I'm showing over here are, as I said, a small selection of black and white prints. There were many other kinds of prints. So before I, so that we can properly understand what might be some of the differences, you know, uh, be, be, uh, uh, between these black and bright, uh, white prints and these prints here, I thought I should, I should just show you some of the differences, suggest some of the differences. So here you see a much more, comparatively speaking, a much more elaborate print. So you see the goddess here um, in the middle um, and, and then you see Gandhi on top, on the top left, uh, and you see uh, Subhash Bose. Subhash Bose is another major nationalist figure. And you see Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, who is going to become the first prime minister of India on the bottom right. And on the bottom left, you see Sardar Patel. So these are these three are, in addition to Gandhi, some of the other leading figures in the Indian National Congress. Um, uh, there's a long uh, history to each of these figures, but uh, it's not necessary for me to enter into their histories at this point in time. And you can see that the figure of the goddess is imposed upon a map of India. So here are the contours of the map. Uh, you, see, you see the tricolor, the map of India over here, um, uh, the chakra over here. Uh, it's the tricolor as it's called. And you see uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, 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 the figure, you know, some of the elements of that iconography. When we speak of the iconography, each god, goddess, just as in Christian um, uh, uh, art, uh, each saint, for example, has an iconography, the elements by which you can identify what makes one saint different than another. So this is the iconography, all the things that are being held uh, by the goddess in her hands, and she represents Mother India, and you can see the halo around her here as well, all right? Uh, this, uh, you look at the caption at the bottom, at the very bottom, our savior. Uh, this is how Gandhi was viewed as. Uh, this is uh, a print that would have been produced uh, 1948, uh, um, uh, possibly earlier. Uh, there's no date on the print. Uh, usually, when, when, usually when the print is produced, after January 30th, 1948, which is the day of Gandhi's assassination, then you see the stigmata, as it were. You see, you see, uh, you see the bullet marks on Gandhi's chest, and you see the blood dripping from it. Uh, but it does say "Our Savior," uh, so here there is a recognition of the fact that 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 uh, you know uh, uh, that uh, Gandhi is a, a divine uh, figure. You can hear, you can see the women at the bottom over here paying their obeisance to him, uh, uh, homage with flowers. And Gandhi is, as it were, ascending into heaven. He, of course, predominates, right? He fills the screen. He fills the screen over here, as you can see clearly from here. And this one is an extraordinary, uh, uh, very simple, but an extraordinary uh, print. Um, um, 
post assassination of Gandhi. So here you see what I'm calling the stigmata here, using a Christian term again, uh, the, the, uh, the, the injuries uh, uh, inflicted on him, the three bullet wounds from the, from the revolver of the assassin. Um, and uh, why is this extraordinary? Of course, because this takes us back to Christian art, uh, La Pieta, right? Uh, 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 Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus uh, in the lap of um, um, uh, the Madonna, right? That's, that's the figure that is very familiar to people who know the history of Christian art. And so what the printmaker did here in India uh, was to take that, that template and simply transplant as it were uh, the, the Indian figure uh, onto that, the figure of Gandhi. And you, here you see the tricolor um, uh, at, at the back. All right, now we move to these black and white prints. Uh, I, I'm beginning with, with, with a print that, uh, so I will show them to you not in chronological order as such, although there will be something of that actually, uh, but, I, but I will show it to you in thematic order, but I wanted to actually begin with the end of Gandhi's life because in this previous print, as we have seen over here, uh, this, is, this is post assassination, post 30th January, 1948. Uh, uh, they would have been produced, by the way, within weeks after Gandhi's assassination and circulated. I'll say a little bit, a little bit about the circulation of these prints in a, in a few moments. But one other thing that we must take note of when we look at a print like this is the fact that the printmaker, the person who actually did the print, is effortlessly moving across cultural boundaries, right? The fact, the fact that this template for this comes from, from Christian art, from uh, a kind of hagiographic representation, which has a long history in, in Christian art, none of this impedes the printmaker in India from using this motif. The fact that it was Christian, the fact that it was Western, the fact that this kind of representation may not be altogether familiar to viewers in India, none of this deterred the printmaker in India from saying, hey, I can actually imaginatively, productively deploy this image for my purposes here in India, right? So when we think about cultural borrowings from one culture to another across borders, it happens all the times. Think about how the printmaker is really working with this material. All right. So now here is a here is so this is the kind of print that we are going to be focusing on for the rest of my lecture here today. All right. Uh, uh, and before I go on to discuss this print, so I'm beginning with this only because we have seen the previous print, which is also post assassination. This one shows you the assassin of uh, Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, that is uh, a man by the name of Nathuram Godse, um, uh, who uh, uh, you know is on the evening of 30th January 1948, shortly after PM, 5 p.m., uh, going to come right in front of Gandhi, take out his revolver and shoot him point blank. Uh, three bullets in his chest and, and Gandhi is going to die uh, almost immediately. Uh, these are his two grand nieces over here. Um, and the print is of course very interesting. Uh, because uh, uh, you can see that Gandhi uh, is in an act of homage almost, right? But the, this man comes in front of Gandhi and Gandhi sort of puts his hands together uh, in homage as it were, uh, and the man whips out this revolver and shoots him dead. And of course, one can interpret the print in a number of ways. One can say that, that even at the moment that Gandhi was dying, he was already forgiving his assassin for this act, right? You could say that Gandhi recognized the divinity within this man, right? Which might seem like a bizarre interpretation, but he is a human being, and right? And he pays his respect to him almost, right? Right. So, and of course, we are not we are not finished with the interpretation. We could add a great many other things. You know, what is what does the printmaker decide to show, and what do they decide to omit? So here you can see the stigmata, right? You can see the red the red drops over here of blood, 
over here, uh, you see the, the little watch there. Uh, and one of the reasons we know what time Gandhi was assassinated is that when the bullets hit him, he fell and his, his stopwatch, little, little time piece here, which he tucked into his dhoti, right? Hit the ground when Gandhi hit the ground himself and it cracked and it stopped. And it's as if time stopped, right? History stopped, life stopped. Right? So there are great many things that are really going on in this print. But before we get on to the other prints, I want to say something about who these printmakers were, whether we know anything about them, how were these prints circulated, how many of, how many of them were printed. And the fact of the matter is that we know actually very, very little. We know very little about these prints, how many were printed? Were there 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000? Uh, what did people do with them when they were printed, right? I mean, today you would collect them. So the vast majority of the prints that you're seeing here are from my private collection. I mean, 99.99% of them would have been destroyed. They would have just been thrown out. Just like, you know, you see a poster. I mean, I went to this demonstration and I shouldn't call it a demonstration, uh, a victory celebration uh, after uh, the networks called the election for Biden uh, on a Friday evening, I think it was, and then Saturday morning, I went downtown. I'm talking about the previous two weeks ago, um, uh, I went downtown uh, to uh, where the uh, city hall is and, and there were people out there uh, and there were posters. Right now, most of these posters are going to be thrown out. I mean, that's the kind of material we're talking about in a way, right? Uh, uh, but uh, is it possible that some of these prints and what's the size of these prints? So we're we're, we're talking about roughly about uh, uh, one and a half feet by one feet approximately. So in this case, it's going to be about one and a half feet uh, lengthwise and uh, about one one foot uh, 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 by height. Uh, right? And, and of course, the vertical prints, uh, it's the other way around. But that's roughly the size of the prints that we're really speaking about. I mean, some of them are slightly larger, some slightly smaller, depending on where, uh, which, which printing press and which printmakers workshop these prints came out of. Is it possible some of them were actually placed in public places? Now, this one wouldn't have been because it would not be the appropriate kind of print to place in a public space. And when I say a public space, today the equivalent would be, let's say, a library bulletin board, a college bulletin board, you know, a bus stop, uh, uh, electricity pole, you know, it's like the cat in the neighborhood, uh, a person in the neighborhood has lost their cat and they put up a sign on one of the poles, right? Uh, were, these, were these prints pasted in that fashion? Well, we don't really know. We don't know how many were printed. We have really no knowledge of that. Were they handed uh, from a person to person as gifts? Did a person hold them up and have and and have and and explain to the thirty people gathered around that person, right? As you might in a village or under a large banyan tree, would that person then explain? Well, this is what's really going on in this print. We really don't know anything about any of that. Now, do we know anything about the printmaker? And when I say the printmaker, I mean here the artist. So in this print, if you, where my cursor here is right now, it says P. Dayal, 48 Kanpur. So P. P, P Dayal is Prabhu Dayal. His name is spelled um, in full in a number of prints. Um, and I do have an accompanying article uh, based on these, uh, which uh, I will put up if anybody wants to look up the names there. Uh, and 48 refers to 1948, the year 1948, which is obvious here because this was done after Gandhi's assassination on January 30th of that year. And Kanpur is a city, it's a city in North India uh, where Prabhu Dayal was based. Uh, if you look at the bottom left over here, it says published by Shyam Sundar Lal Agarwal, picture publishers choke. Kanpur. So Kanpur, as I've said, is a city in North India. Uh, chok is the crossroads. So usually there are at least four roads that meet at a chok. Um, most Indian cities, particularly the older cities, will have one, multiple choks 
so you can just simply think of it as a crossroads. Uh, and picture publishers sometimes called picture merchants. So what Prabhu, the, what Sham Sundarlal Agarwal actually ran was a printmaker's workshop. Um, Prabhu Dayal would have been one of the artists who put together the prints. Sham Sundarlal Agarwal, this man whose name here appears at the bottom left, was in fact the man who owned this print shop. He is the merchant. He has set up a shop. And part of that shop would have been given over uh, to actually making these prints, right? So they would have, and then there would have been a print, there would have been a printing press, but there were a number of printing presses that were used. Okay, a number of printing presses that were used. Uh, uh, you can notice, by the way, here it says on the top bottom left, copyright. Um, and then it gives you the copyright number. In other words, this printmaker was, he might have been a nationalist, might have been enamored of, the, of Gandhi, might have been a great supporter of the nationalist movement, but at the same time, he was also a merchant. He had to make money. So he did put a copyright on his prints uh, with the expectation that he would get royalties and that if someone else wanted to reprint this, they would have to obviously pay a certain portion of the proceeds. And as I've indicated to you, uh, the, the printmaker's workshop, the artist are different, and then the printing press is different. And here, if you look here where my cursor, cursor here, it says modern press, Kanpur. So then there was a printing press where they would have reeled off, let's say 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, however many number of copies of this print they were going to uh, 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 publish. Uh, uh, and uh, and Shams and their Lal Agarwal used a large number of printers. I mean, we know of at least six or seven printers that he used, and and many of the prints that I have actually show at least three or four other printers who were in use. All right. Now, a couple more observations before we move on to the next set of prints, and then we'll go through them in rapid succession, and I'll give a brief commentary and explain what each of these prints is really showing. Um, but I'm still giving you here now the background to these prints itself. Uh, and, and so the first comment here is um, that the city of Kanpur uh, was an important city, at least for uh, the for these uh, uh, for being a hospitable place to these printmakers. All right. Uh, uh, today, the city of Kanpur is one of the most polluted cities in the world. Uh, it has a rather notorious reputation for being extremely dirty, uh, and you wouldn't have thought it likely that something as interesting as this was coming out of this city back in, let's say, 1920, 1930s, 1940s. Uh, but Kanpur was an important site of political activity. Uh, the Communist Party had its first, the Communist Party of India um, had its first meeting um, uh, in the city uh, of uh, Kanpur, its inaugural meeting in December uh, 1925. Uh, because the Communist Party had its inaugural meeting there, you can understand that it was an important center for, center for uh, labor unions, for working class uh, activity. It was also an important city uh, for what is called the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army. Uh, the acronym that is used is HSRA, very often in the literature. So this was a group of revolutionaries, as they called themselves, uh, who uh, had decided that they were not going to disavow the use of violence, so that unlike Gandhi, who many of them still respected, but they also thought that, well, there's no reason why we cannot use violence as well to achieve liberation from British rule. Because much like the Congress party, their fundamental interest was independence from colonial serfdom, right? From the yoke of colonial rule. Uh, and the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army, they called themselves socialists also because many of them were, were uh, self-declared uh, adherents uh, of Marxism. Uh, and there are lots of differences amongst them, but again, that's a subject that is not presently under consideration and not entirely germane to what uh, I want to talk about here. The importance of all of that is, is to underscore the importance of Kanpur uh, 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 in, in the political life uh, of North India, especially in the 1920s and 1930s, 
And that might explain why the printmakers, many of them came from the city of Kanpur, that it was a beehive of uh, political activity, all right? Now, one more thing on a personal note, which is that um, I tracked down the, the grandson of Sham Sundarlal Agarwal, the person here who uh, ran this workshop. And I call it a workshop because there would have been probably several artists. I mean, we know at least of three or four because their, their signatures are on the prints. Right? Uh, so he may have had more than three, four. There might have been many more. There might have been some who only concentrated on these nationalist prints. Uh, but how, whatever the case may be, uh, Sham Sundar Lal Agarwal was unquestionably one of the most important printmakers. And so I tracked down his grandson through a fortuitous set of circumstances uh, and found that in fact, his grandson knew absolutely nothing about the business of his grandfather, right? Knew absolutely nothing. I mean, I knew far more than he did about the business of his grandfather. He only knew that, that, that his grandfather produced these prints. Um, uh, and to him, these were just objects that you, that you sold. And in fact, the way I got to get in touch with him is that there is a, there is a uh, uh, antique prints dealer with whom I work, I buy, my prints from him, um, uh, and and this man told me about two years ago that he had gotten a, a supply of some of these prints of 1920s and 30s, which I was surprised to hear because when he said supply, it sounded like more than one or two odd prints which show up on the market every now and then. And lo and behold, he had a couple of hundred, and he told me he had gotten them from this grandson. Uh, uh, and so I so I finally tracked him down and I spoke to him on the phone, but he knew nothing about it. But he did share with me. Uh, a document um, uh, which he didn't really fully know the significance of. And that document is a document whereby, which shows that this particular printmaker, Sham Sundarlal Agarwal, was in fact prosecuted by the British government of India on charges of sedition. Mm -hmm. That is that because he was pr producing these prints and these prints were obviously advocating for Indian independence, mm -hmm. uh, this man, was in fact actually prosecuted on charges of sedition. So in fact, at one point, the colonial state sent some officials and they actually barged into his, into his workshop and confiscated some of the material there, right? So, so what he shared with me was the court case, which I wasn't aware of, uh, although he didn't have the full proceedings of it. So, uh, you, you know, it's, it's also an interesting reflection for those of you who are history majors on thinking about what we call the archive, right? How does an archive come together? How does one think about an archive? What gets left out of an archive? What gets put in there? Very interesting set of questions to think about, all right? Now, um, so um, with this, I move on to now the set of prints here. So, so here again, you'll see, by the way, at the bottom, at uh, the bottom over here, uh, where my cursor here is, you'll see published by Sham Sundarlal, Picture Merchant Chalk. So it's the same, uh, it's the same uh, printmaker. Um, and uh, uh, you find the same thing mentioned in Hindi here as well. So here in Hindi, at the bottom of the print, it says Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and it says on the top here, Shanti Ke Devta. Shanti Ke Devta means uh, 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 the, the, uh, um, uh, the god of peace, okay? Uh, Devta is peace. So, so basically the emissary of peace is the best way to uh, uh, think about her, uh, uh, about him here, right? That's what the print is suggesting. This is Dharampatni Mahatma Gandhi. So the legally wedded wife of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. This is Kasturba Bhai, right? Kasturba Bhai. Uh, so this is a, a portrait, very simple portrait of Gandhi. Uh, this would go back to um, roughly about the mid 1920s. And on the right, you see a portrait of um, uh, Kasturba. Um, uh, and the same print, notice the one on the left here, but the caption now is different because this has a different caption. It's a very interesting caption, <clears throat> which it says, Rashtra ke sutradhar. So sutra is a thread. 
okay, thread. Uh, dhar, sutra dhar is the, the person who is spinning, weaving the thread, okay? All right, so Rashtra is nation. So this is the man who is spinning the nation's destiny, right? That's a little more elaborate translation of the caption, but that's what it's really conveying, right? That, you know, the Sutradhar is also, by the way, a storyteller, the man who's telling the story. So he is in fact telling the nation's story, right? But he is also because Sutra literally means thread, right? So you thread together a story, just as you use thread and you eventually with each stroke of the needle and the thread, you put together a, a textile, right? Okay, so he is the storyteller. He's telling the nation's story, right? but he's also spinning the nation's destiny. Very simple caption, but very elegant. All right, and of course, a very simple here uh, uh, boundary over here, uh, completely unadorned, much like the man himself, right? Almost barren, right? So this is Gandhi. He is now, this is post 1922, 1921, because he has already now started to strip himself down. Right, um, you know, I have this famous quip, if I may say so. Um, the quip being that Gandhi began his adult life. If you read his autobiography, he goes to London. He's very fancifully dressed, right? And he buys, you know, um, uh, you know, a coat tail. He uh, a top hat. Uh, he takes lessons and dancing. All of that, very elaborately dressed like a gentleman. Right, so as I've argued, Gandhi began his adult life vastly overdressed and he's going to end his life vastly underdressed. He's going to start to strip himself bare, right? Like the truth, you know, offer the world unvarnished truth. Right? But the print here is very simple, unadorned. And here you see Gandhi bare chested, just wearing a dhoti, a loin cloth, um, uh, head, shorn of hair and he's in a pensive mode, right? And then here you have Azadi ke pegambar ki ghoshna. This is the caption here on the top that you see over here, okay? Uh, again, you see the border there. And what does a, uh, Azadi ke pegambar ki ghoshna? Uh, the caption is basically saying, this is the, the, the demands of the messenger of freedom. Okay, uh, the Ghoshna is really announcement literally, but it's the, so the messenger, the emissary of freedom is stipulating what his demands are, right? Now, I don't have time here to go through all of these demands over here, but what this is a reference to here is the demands that were placed by Gandhi, okay? Put forward before Lord Irwin, the Viceroy in January 1930, before he set out on his salt march, right? And so what were some of these demands that the British should help in imposing a total prohibition? He wanted a reduction of the land revenue because the land revenue, the taxation that is was so high that it was impoverishing um, the, the uh, peasantry. He wanted a reduction in military expenditures by at least 50%. He wanted a protective tariff on imported clothes to protect Indian textiles and the elimination of the salt tax, right? So remember that he, that he, he writes a letter to Lord Irvin, right? And says that, you know, the salt tax should be eliminated because salt is an essential commodity in India. Remember that the British had a monopoly on the production, distribution, and sale of salt, right? So these are the demands and this poster, this is very likely the kind of poster that would actually have been placed on a public, um, uh, you know, uh, at a public place, uh, at a bulletin board, uh, uh, outside a railway station, uh, outside, a, outside a grocery store, um, outside the city hall, and so on, right? This very likely would have been. Many of the other prints may not have been, right? Bhagwan ki takli, right? So we're still seeing 
relatively the same style. It, it will get a little more complicated as we move on to the next stage one, next next ones. And here again, you can see the name. So you always see the name of the uh, the uh, uh, the printmaker here, and and usually it's bilingual. It's in English. Uh, and Hindi, and then you see the copyright there. Uh, and Bhagwan ki takli, so takli, uh, takli here is the spindle because Gandhi was a great advocate of spinning uh, and uh, weaving. And one of the reasons for that, as you might, as some of you might recall, is because uh, he wanted to he wanted to uh, uh, have Indians become self reliant. Right, this was a source of income, uh, and of course there is a long history where the history really goes back to you know, the 17th, 17th century, 18th century, when India was the largest manufacturer of textiles in the world. Indian textiles were famous the world over, including uh, the, 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 the colonies on the Eastern seaboard uh, of America before it became the United States of America. And then of course, even after, even after, the, declare, even after the United States became an independent country, um, uh, and moving into the late 18th century, 19th century, uh, the U.S. was still uh, importing uh, uh, textiles from India. India was uh, the major player in the market. Uh, and what's going to happen is that India is going to become um, decades, uh, 100, 150 years after the imposition of colonial rule, the largest importer of textiles in the world. Um, so, uh, so it's the it's the destruction of these, of these uh, uh, cottage uh, manufacturing, as it's called. Cottage industry means something that people did in their homes. All right, uh, that's why it's called a cottage industry, as opposed to a centralized industrial plant. Uh, and Gandhi, but I've already explained to you that Gandhi is using this whole metaphor of spinning and weaving in in many ways. Uh, so Bhagwan ki takli is. Uh, the spindle of God, as it were, literally. All right. Now here it says Gandhi ashram. So now we would do his move to his ashram. That Gandhi came, at, uh, and here at the bottom it says Sabarmati. Sabarmati is an ashram that Gandhi established in Ahmedabad. Uh, once he returned from South Africa in uh, 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 1915, in January 1915, uh, Gandhi wanted to establish an ashram. Uh, a, a, you know, some form of communal living, as it would be called in English. Uh, and uh, this was something that he had done in South Africa, too. So he set up an ashram in the city of Ahmedabad in a place called Kochrab, which had to be abandoned only a few months later for a number of reasons, uh, including the fact that there was an onset of malaria in that area. Uh, but then eventually he moves into a, play, a, a new place, which is called Sabarmati, and this print here shows life in Sabarmati. So here you see the spinning wheel, Gandhi sitting there, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, underneath this hut, a sheaf of papers in front of him. Someone here is sweeping uh, the uh, the grounds of the ashram. So it was this was a form of community living. There were men and women. Both the men and the women uh, performed all the jobs equally. Uh, and Gandhi himself did that too. It, 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 uh, we should not by any stretch of the imagination suppose that Gandhi exempted himself from this uh, kind of work. Sabarmati, uh, I could literally spend two hours talking about Sabarmati, the importance of Sabarmati, uh, because the ashram was not simply a form of communal living for him, for Gandhi. Um, and it was not simply a stationary place, by which I mean that yes, there was a place called Sabarmati, but but it was a mobile ashram. Where wherever Gandhi went, he attempted to develop a kind of a community which would represent the ethos of the ashram, right? And that ethos was shared living, shared notions of trust, right? Shared notions of trust, shared duties, shared activities, right? where there would be no secrecy, no privacy. All of these are very complicated ideas. You know, what was Gandhi's relationship to the, to the private and the public, for example. But, but the ashram is one way to think through some of those ideas. 
Uh, and it is at Sabarmati Ashram that Gandhi is going to be arrested. Now you can see over here, this is a very different print and it's from a different printmaker, uh, unlike this print over here, where which is again from the same workshop here that I've men been mentioning to you before, the Sham Sundar Lal Agarwal, I won't mention that again. Um, and, it, and here the name of the printer is given, which is different than the name of the printer for one of the previous prints that we had seen. So there were a number of printing presses that are involved and keep in mind that there was some risk for these printing presses because, because the state could come and could, could, could stop the printing, confiscate the material, burn the prints and say that you're actually engaging in seditious activity. All right, uh, so here, this is a, a really a very interesting print uh, where Gandhi is going to be arrested on charges of sedition um, and uh, they, they come in the middle, they come in the, the middle of the night. Uh, 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 evidently, Gandhi would have been perhaps asleep, which is one reason why the the uh, 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 the one of the of, the officials who has come uh, to arrest him is shining uh, his flashlight or torch, as we call it in India, right? His flashlight, um, and and you can see that 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 uh, you know you might have thought that well perhaps. Actually, the printmaker would have put the the beam of light uh, over his head, much like a halo. He doesn't really quite do that, uh, but he does show Gandhi in uh, this ray of light over there. All right, and there are many other interesting things going on in this print. For example, notice on over here on this side table, this little clock. All right, little small bedside time piece. Right? And you notice, of course, that in many of the prints, I mean, I pointed that out to you previously. And when you look at some of the other prints, see if you can find it, right? The, the, the time piece that Gandhi wore on his dhoti. Um, again, a subject for a long lecture in itself, Gandhi's relationship to time and temporality. Uh, you've all heard of the, uh, you know, of this quip uh, more than a quip, some people, people take it obviously much more seriously and have historically taken it much more seriously uh, that punctuality is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, one of the key elements uh, of the, uh, the Protestant uh, ethos, okay? Uh, timeliness and punctuality being next to godliness, uh, as it were, in the, in the Protestant ethos. Well, by that token, Gandhi was a Protestant Christian, by that token. Uh, because Gandhi was extremely attentive to time, extremely attentive, did not at all like being late to anything, right? And, and, and kept a detailed, meticulous record of how he spent his time, right? So a proper examination of that would actually entail what was Gandhi's notion of time, right? Was it simply, as I've said, this kind of Protestant notion of time? Uh, is he a Benjamin like Benjamin Franklin like figure? You know, uh, Benjamin Franklin was also very fastidious about about time. He was also very fastidious about about money, right? That you know, how much did he spend uh, on potatoes? How much did he spend on tobacco? Uh, every given day, everything would be jotted down, right? That kind of fastidiousness to detail. And you do see an extraordinary fastidiousness to detail in Gandhi, which is all the more remarkable because he could keep the very large picture in his mind all the time, all the time, right? So while he is negotiating for India's independence in the mid 1940s, at the same time, he always takes the trouble to ask his grandniece, well, Manu, have you taken your medicine today? What dose did you take, right? Did you wash your hair, right? And he records everything. He is attentive to everything because Gandhi's principle was the, the micro and the macro, both are equally important in life, all right? It's not like, oh, I'm, I'm a big man, so I'm gonna leave all the smaller details to my servants, to my staff, 
right? I can't be bothered with any of that. You know, I'm a great thinker or I'm the president of the United States. I just look at the big picture. I wish the president of the United States would look at some picture other than his own. Uh, but no, here it was attentiveness, right? And, and, and the printmaker is in a way capturing some of that, right? Because why does he put that? And you could say, well, he simply puts that there because Gandhi had a clock by his bedside table, but the printmaker could easily have ignored it. But the in important thing is it tells us something about these objects and what is their relationship, right, to Gandhi's life. All right, uh, here we have Satyagra Yog Sadhan. Okay, so here you see Gandhi in the pose of a yogi, yoga, sadhan. So the practice of Satyagra as the practice of yoga. It's actually quite a complicated print here. Uh, and and uh, there are certainly some things that are being borrowed from the Hindu uh, mythos uh, from the vast storehouse of Hindu mythology because there's a very famous scene in the Mahabharat, the great Indian epic uh, where, where uh, one of the great teachers, Bhishma lies on a bed of nails and delivers his last final philosophical speech, right? So clearly this is in some ways a kind of a variation on that. Uh, there is a lot going on in this print, not all of which I am at liberty to explain right now because it would really take quite some time and I won't repeat this thing again. So you'll have to understand that this is uh, the limitation uh, that we will have to think about when we look at some of the other prints too. But just to give you, and I, that that I won't mention that that I'm only addressing a few points, right? Uh, henceforth in each of these prints. But here, what we see here is we see that ray of light uh, illuminating him. Um, on the right here is Jawaharlal Nehru, um, uh, 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 one of Gandhi's principal uh, disciples, uh, and his father, the father of Jawaharlal Nehru. So this is famous family and, and, and politics, uh, which survived in India down to the present day, but a mere shadow of what it used to be. Uh, and, and, and this is uh, Jawaharlal's uh, father, Motilal Nehru, uh, both of whom, Motilal and Jawaharlal were both highly westernized figures, but became uh, great followers of, uh, of Gandhi. All right. Um, and um, th there is a suggestion here among other things in this print that the practice of nonviolence uh, is something that can also be seen as akin to the practice of yoga, not yoga here in the mechanical sense in which it is very often viewed. For example, in the US where people just go to these yoga classes and they do Hatha yoga, which is really postures because this is the fuller meaning of yoga, uh, which has always been part of the uh, Indian uh, uh, tradition. All right, and what is that fuller meaning that I'm really speaking about here? What I'm really speaking about is um, the fact that, so before I mention that, I should say that I'm paraphrasing really what Patanjali says. Patanjali is the author of a text called the Yoga Sutras, uh, which goes back to roughly about 1800 years ago, let's say about uh, 200 uh, of the common uh, uh, era, right? that the freedom of spiritual integrity is experienced in the act of discipline itself. And this discipline itself is rendered superfluous by the reality that the practice actually discloses. So if I may paraphrase yet again, my paraphrase of Patanjali put it in much, much simpler language now, that you see yoga is really the dialectic of freedom and discipline. And you cannot be free. You cannot understand freedom unless you have first understood discipline, all right? And once you have understood then, then that discipline is no longer viewed as a constraint, right? This, this is essentially what is really being suggested um, by the idea of yoga. And, and the print in many ways is looking at this particular dialectic. Uh, here, what we have is uh, Tyag Murti Pandit Motilal. I'm just reading the caption at the top in Hindi here. Uh, Tyag Murti Motilal uh, Pandit uh, 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 Pandit Motilal Nehru ki 
uh, Antim Yatra. So the last, uh, the last Yatra is re really technically, literally a voyage, uh, the last trip. Uh, so what does this mean here? Uh, Moti Lal Nehru has passed away. <coughs> and, and you can see here, see him here. Uh, uh, his body is being carried by four men uh, on their shoulders and he's being taken. You know, these are the pallbearers, right? Uh, as you find in, um, in modern Christian life as well, there, there's a pallbearers and they're carrying his body. In Hinduism, you, of course, you, uh, you cremate the body, you burn it. Uh, and so this is the last rite of passage of the life of Pandit Motilal Nehru. Uh, this print uh, is showing, uh, you might think, well, what's the relationship to Gandhi? Well, it's obvious, right? That Gandhi is one of the pallbearers that even though Gandhi was uh, by this time, um, the leading figure in Indian politics, he, he was a man who understood that, that there were many others who were uh, besides him in this struggle, right, who were taking part and that they had all achieved greatness in their own fashion. And, and Gandhi here acts as one of the pallbearers uh, carrying the body of Pandit Motilal Nehru. Uh, most Indian viewers would have recognized many of the other figures. We, we won't get into uh, who all of these other figures are, but here you can see you know, the masses, the people uh, of the Indian National Congress, the lay followers all lined up behind. Um, now we get to an extraordinary set of prints. Uh, I will not discuss over here uh, because this will take up too much time. I will just give you the background. I won't discuss the, 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 the lengthy sort of captions over here. The caption on the top is the most important over here uh, because it says here, a sayog govardhan. Okay. Okay. So uh, asayog is non-cooperation, right? So Gandhi had initiated a movement of non-cooperation against British rule. You're all familiar with that by now, right? What is Govardhan? What is that? It's a mountain. And why is Gandhi here, right over here? And what's his particular posture that he has, right? I'll explain all of that in a moment. Why is he seemingly lifting a mountain? All right. So now, the antecedents of this story go back to the life of Krishna, an Indian god, uh, one of the most popular deities um, in Hinduism. Right? And, and Krishna is a cowherd. Uh, he's a god, but he's also a cowherd. And, and you see the cow there behind, behind uh, uh, Gandhi. So, so the first thing that's happening here is uh, so that you can begin to understand how the printmaker is working. And remember, what, what is a printmaker trying to do? The printmaker is trying to get across to common Indians the life of Gandhi, trying to convey to them some of his greatness. Okay. What is singular about Gandhi, right? So many of these prints that you've seen, this one being a very good illustration that the Gandhi may not be the only figure in the print. I mean, you saw some of the early ones here where Gandhi is the only figure, right? For example, over here. And, and, and in this print, he is clearly the print, print is located around him. He is a central figure uh, in the print. Uh, and over here as well but there are other people hovering around him, all right? But if you see this one here, you don't seem to see really so much the singularity of Gandhi, except that he's on the foreground. He's immediately the figure in the foreground, all right? Because one of the, one of the things that printmakers always wanted to convey was that Gandhi is a man of the masses, right? He belongs to the masses, he's one of them. He comes out of them, but he's also singular. He's also singular. He's one of the masses, but he is exceptional. He's sui generis. Right? He's a devta. He's a god. Right? So the printmaker had to do quite a bit of work sometimes to be able to do both of these things at the same time. And here again, you see him with a number of figures, but again, he's in the foreground and he's centered at the print. So clearly this establishes the fact that there are other major political figures right, who are all positioned here in the background, 
and you can identify each of them, right? So for example, these are what are called the Ali brothers over here. This is Lala Lajpat Rai. This is Chitranjan Das. These are all major Indian politicians. This is a slightly earlier phase where we're talking about the early 1920s when Jawaharlal was much less important, okay? Uh, these were the major figures really at that time. So you can say that the print goes back really to, to that time. And this print, it comes from a different printmaker different shop, all right? So now what is the printmaker attempting to do? What the printmaker is attempting to do is to, is to take the figure of an Indian God, take a story from the life of Krishna and put Gandhi in the place of Krishna, right? And, and what is the story being told here? That because Krishna is a cowherd, but at the same time, he's divine, he's God. So there's a flood that comes once and the way that Krishna rescues the people from the flood is he lifts the whole city and the mountain top, right? So there's a mountain top and you can see a little bit of the landscape over here, but he lifts the entire landscape and he holds it on his finger, right? So, and, and this, by the way, this, the way he's, the legs are crossed, you can see that this is again, uh, the posture that Krishna would have taken. And of course, Govardhan, which is the name of the mountain, this mythical mountain, as it were, in the life of, that figures in the life of Krishna, right? That suggests that this figure is Krishna as well. So what the printmaker has done is conveyed to the people that Gandhi is our modern day Krishna. And much as Krishna could save the town, the city, the whole landscape, the world from a deluge, Gandhi can save us from the pandemic, the deluge of colonial rule, right? And what will come at the end of it? Ram Rajya, the kingdom of Ram, this utopian kingdom of bliss, right? And so you see at the bottom portion of that, you see this Ram Rajya here, you see uh, uh, you know, a couple in their modest home, people practicing the arts of agriculture, you know, a simple contented life, right? That's what the printmaker is doing. And he's saying asayog, non-cooperation, that this element of non-cooperation, if we cease to cooperate with the ruler, with the colonial ruler, we will become free because without our collaboration, we cannot be enslaved. All right, okay. Um, and over here, asa yog noka ke teen chatur malaha. Okay, so asa yog, again, that same word, non-cooperation. <coughs> noka, boat, the boat of non-cooperation. It's three clever fishermen, okay? So here's, here's so non-cooperation is like a rocky boat. It's a, like a boat in the midst of a river. You know, if, if you, uh, in the midst of the sea, rather I should say in the midst of a sea, you know, if a storm comes, okay? Uh, if there's high tide, the boat can be rocked. <coughs> the boat can be rocked. It can be unsteady. And this path of non-cooperation has its perils. You know, we have to be careful. We need, we need sturdy fishermen to keep the boat steady, right? That's what these three figures here are. So there's Gandhi again, uh, and there's Motilal, Motilal Nehru and his son, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, and here you have the figure of Mother India, the goddess, right? The goddess of, that's what, so she is there to sort of like, she's, she's there as the super ego, she is the, figure who's supervening all of this, that it is obviously in part with her blessing as well that this project, this enterprise of non-cooperation is taking place, right? <clears throat> and here you have a, a print far too long to go into, far too complicated to go into, but essentially on the right here, it says a vision of non-cooperation. Um, you can see here, Joshi Brothers, the, this is, this identifies uh, where the printmaker is uh, coming from. 
uh, and uh, uh, the printmaker's uh, uh, name, Joshi Brothers, uh, Fort Bombay. So this is from Western India, from what is now modern day uh, Mumbai. Uh, 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 Bombay, uh, Kanpur, Calcutta, Lahore, Delhi, Lucknow. These were some of the major cities where printmakers were working from. Um, and what this, this is a very graphic print. This is, <clears throat> this is a, a print that again, uses large elements of Hindu mythology uh, as well. Uh, 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 stories of what happens when people who are evil, uh, how they get consumed by the fire of greed and anger and self-aggrandizement. Uh, you know, uh, it contrasts, uh, if I may put it this way, uh, the life of the demons with the life of the gods. All right, um, but there is a continuum, as we'll find in Hinduism, between the demons and the god, because gods sometimes descend to the level of demons, much like a demon can get reformed, and and once good comes into the life of a demon, a demon can move towards being divine. Now, this print here <coughs> uh, is showing uh, Shanti Sagar at the bottom over here. So that is the ocean of peace, right? The ocean of peace. And here you see Mohandas Gandhi right here at the bottom, uh, reclined over here. Uh, so this is the classic repose of the god Vishnu, right? Um, <clears throat> and you see the spindle over here uh, in the hand over here. This is the spinning wheel. Uh, as I said, it'll take far too long to go into all the elements of it. But on the top layer here, you see what you might call the life of the demon. You see here, uh, 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 Englishman with an Indian woman. This is a notch girl. So then you get down to uh, the level of the, the kind of evil that, that uh, human beings uh, uh, fall prey to. And then at the bottom most level here, you begin to see the possibilities of redemption, if I may put it this way, right? That once non-cooperation becomes possible, uh, it is possible to actually um, uh, uh, overcome uh, evil. Uh, and, and this particular print here, you see that the bridge of non-cooperation has, has fallen down. Um, uh, uh, non-cooperation, Setu Bandhan here it says, uh, Setu is, 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 is a bridge, all right? Uh, and again, this story is drawing upon elements of the Hindu mythos. So many of the viewers, not all of them would have been familiar with the story of the Ramayana. Uh, in the Ramayana, you have uh, the epic uh, character Ram, who symbolizes good, and he is going to um, uh, cross over on a bridge to Lanka, where his wife Sita is being held in captivity. Right? Uh, of course, these, these prints are made for an Indian audience, because you can't expect anyone who doesn't have some of familiarity with Hindu mythos. And this is where literacy would not have mattered because many Indians who were completely illiterate would have known the stories of the Ramayana, the stories of the Mahabharata, the story of Krishna. Uh, whether they would have understood all the elements of the print or not uh, is really again something that we would have to uh, probe at, at length. right? We would have to look at a whole range of other literature to see what was their understanding of it. Remember that that once you move outside the print, you get vernacular folk editions of the Ramayana, which show clearly that people were deeply invested in the story of the Ramayana um, and, the, and, and the Mahabharat, right? Um, so I'm just describing to you some small elements of this, um, but bear in mind, as I said, that one could do a, a far fuller uh, interpretation of such a print. Uh, and this one here is Dandi Genamaki Lut, uh, which is what it says there on the top here. So uh, the word loot, you've all heard of looting. Uh, recall that the word was being used prolifically uh, in the summer uh, when the protests were taking place. Uh, and then some looters burst upon the scene in many of these cities and tried to, if I may put it this way, hijack the BLM uh, protests. Uh, and the looting was one way to delegitimize de uh, the, the, uh, the protests. The word loot, uh, which is used in English is a Hindi word. It comes from India. Uh, and uh, uh, Dandi ke Namaki Lut is, refers to 
it refers to the salt march to Gandhi's march to the sea, right? Where he breaks the salt law and then they manufacture the salt, right? So that's what this print is doing here. Uh, this print does not show Gandhi, but I did want to add it uh, to this series of prints over here because it shows an extraordinary um, a scene from the Annals of Indian History. So this is part uh, of what was happening during the course of the Salt March, because very often we think of the Salt March in the singular, that is that Gandhi marching over course of three weeks. And as he marches from his ashram in Sabarmati uh, to the sea, which is a distance of something like 300 kilometers, if I remember correctly, as he marches to this, people are going to join him on the way. But the salt march cannot be viewed only in the singular because once Gandhi had reached Dandi and had in fact um, uh, broken the law, this was a signal to Indians all over the country to do the same. And Darshana Salt Factory was a, uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, factories where salt was manufactured. Uh, um, remember the British had a monopoly on it. And so Sarojini Naidu, there's a woman, uh, one of the key women involved in the nationalist movement, Gandhi uh, adhered to the view that women had a critical role to play in the, in the, in the struggle. And, and Gandhi also had a view that women were more prone to nonviolence than men in any case, that, 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 that a nonviolent movement, one of its many other virtues was the fact that it was singularly more attractive to women than a violent movement might be. Uh, and so the Darshana Salt Works, uh, there is a graphic representation of that in the Attenborough film from 1982, where they went, um, you know, a row after row of uh, demonstrators and each row would be met by uh, the, the police who would crack their skulls and their bodies um, uh, with a wooden stick, uh, with a dandy, okay, with a stick. Uh, uh, and then they would be taken away and then another layer of demonstrators would come. They would be beaten up, then a third layer. Well, that's what this print is really a representation of. Um, and it's important not only because uh, what it shows about the Darshana sword work, but it shows the discipline attached to the idea of nonviolence. Uh, and of course, uh, the spectacular role of women in this movement uh, as well. So uh, I have a lot more prints, but we are well past time. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just go to the very end here um, and uh, show you one uh, last print uh, because this print uh, shows very clearly the sophistication uh, of the printmaker. Uh, th this image over here, I'll go to that print in just a moment. This is not one of those prints, but this is a collage uh, uh, of some of the major nationalist figures. And uh, much of this kind of work was produced in the common, uh, common realm as, uh, as well, all right? But this last print that I want to share, you can see very clearly uh, its relationship to all of the other prints. Uh, same kind of template fundamentally, uh, same printmaker over here. We're talking about Shamsundar Lal Agarwal over here. Uh, and and uh, this one is called the struggle for freedom. So why is this print so spectacular? Uh, one of the things it does is it shows how the printmaker used all the imaginative resources of a civilization as rich as that of India. How the printmaker deployed mythic material if I may call it that, right? To establish uh, a certain argument, to establish a certain view of Gandhi. <clears throat> so what is going on in this print? So you have this great Indian epic, the Ramayana, uh, alongside the Mahabharat. I've mentioned both of them. Uh, and, and so this, you can see that it, it's like a book here, right? You can she see the sheaves of pages here. Uh, and the book, as it were, has been opened. So here it says Ramayan, Bharat Khand. So the, the Ramayan, and then the, the book. So the Ramayan, the book, the, the, the epic is divided into a number of different books. 
uh, which all have names. And so what the printmaker has done is he's actually taken the story of the Mahabharata and used that as a template to describe the epic story, not of the Ramayana, but of the freedom struggle, and then call it Bharat Khan. The chapter here is called Bharat, India. Here's Gandhi over here. He is clearly Ram, the, the hero, okay, of the story in the Ramayana. Uh, and in the Ramayana, in the original epic, you Ram's great antagonist is Ravan, who has 10 heads and 10 hands <clears throat> and all of that, right? And so here you see the British being shown as the demon, as a Ravan, and in their hands are weapons of destruction, right? So one hand here holds a sword. Uh, here, this here, by the way, is you know, it tells you this is from the Indian Penal Code, the section of the Indian Penal Code that was used to imprison revolutionaries. All right. And here's another hand holding the rifle over here. If you see the rifle over here, right? And and of course, here you see on the top over here, you see the British using all the resources at their command, aircraft, right? Bombing people. Uh, all right. So the British become Ravan, Gandhi is Ram, and, and then in the Ramayana, you have the story of Hanuman. So Hanuman is this monkey god, uh, and he is the great devotee, the great devotee of Ram. And here, so uh, Nehru is shown as a Hanuman-like figure, and, and to ensure that the audience, as it were for this print, doesn't miss it, what he does is the printmaker takes a story from, from the Ramayana. Uh, and what that story is, is Ram has a brother who has accompanied uh, him uh, to the for in, into the forest when, when the two brothers and Ram's wife Sita go into exile. Um, and uh, then during the course of the battle with Ravan, much later towards the end, Lakshman gets wounded. And the only way he can be healed is with this herb, which grows on a certain mountain top. So Hanuman is sent to get that herb. You know, he's a monkey god, so he flies, all right? Um, uh, and uh, when he gets to that mountain top, he sees, my God, there are a thousand different herbs. I don't know which one it is. So what does he do? He carries the entire mountain with him, right? So as, and uh, this is the story of what is called the Sanjeevani. Sanjeevani is the life giver. So this herb is what gives you life. And so uh, 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 Nehru here is shown as Hanuman, right? That is that he is the one who is the assistant, if I may put it this way, the great devotee, the great follower uh, of uh, Gandhi. And he is carrying this thing which is going to replenish life. And Hanuman carries a mace with him and you can see that over here very clearly. So in conclusion, what is the printmaker doing here? The printmaker is using the story of the Ramayana, which would have been known to every Indian, right? Young, old men, women, people living in the cities, people living in the rural areas, lower caste, upper caste, literates, illiterates, this story would have been known to everyone. And the printmaker suggests that we ought to view Gandhi as a modern day Ram. This is the way he tries to bring home the story of Gandhi and his greatness to the Indian public. All right, so this is really um, an attempt to show how printmakers worked and how this common print, right? We're not talking about a rare oil painting. We're talking about prints which might have come out in numbers of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. We really don't know that, right? But, but they were common enough. This is the story of the common print and its role in the national imaginary and how it looked at the idea of Gandhi.